thanks for joining us. All right, yeah, good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. No worries. Uh, do you want to just start off and just tell us a little bit about like where you grew up and how you got into filmmaking? Yeah, so um, I grew up in here in the UK um, in a small county called Bedfordshire, which is just just north of London, about an hour's north of London. Um, still live in Bedfordshire. It's, it's very central in the country, so it helps a lot with my work. And I kind of have been filming for the past uh, 10 years or so um in branded content world so a lot of uh content for automotive brands um and various other other uh, brands around the uk making films for social media mostly um and youtube pre-roll ads and things like that um and i kind of yeah i i, I went to university here to study film studies uh, which was a very theory-based course and kind of enjoyed theory and learning about that but actually kind of wanted to be hands-on with cameras so a lot of the stuff that i do now that's all really uh, self-taught um, YouTube videos and things like that. And then just kind of, you know, learning from other people. I got my first job um, in film in 2015 at a company here in Bedfordshire. And that was starting out a very junior role and again, kind of taking on as much experience as possible at that. So over that time, I was able to kind of build up a fair amount of experience. And now I, now I freelance uh, for a bunch of different clients um, have been for the past two years. So, yeah, finally out on my own and uh, and yeah, still still trying to make cool stuff for people. And do you remember any like uh, films that you saw as a kid, like growing up that you kind of were inspired by? I don't know about inspired by. I've, I'm a massive cinephile uh, generally. Like I've, I've always just been really into films, which is why I went and studied it um, at university. I think growing up films like um, The Matrix, first time seeing that, um, I would have been seven years old. Uh, probably too young to watch it, but it looked cool. Um, so stuff like The Matrix, Star Wars has is, is always been a huge uh, part of my life as well. So I like massively into Star Wars. I remember getting the the, uh, the, the remastered trilogy back in 1996, wherever it came out. Since then, really loved that. Um, and also things like Pulp Fiction. I remember that, watching that growing up. There's a lot of films that my parents clearly let me see that maybe I shouldn't have seen at the time, but. Yeah, all the Tarantino stuff definitely um, has always stuck with me. I ended up writing essays about Tarantino films uh, when I was at university. I think as far as films that kind of inspired me, the one that always sticks out to me is uh, Clerks by Kevin Smith, Kevin Smith directed. And that's mainly because of how he made that. And I've listened to a lot of interviews with, with Kevin Smith about that and just very much like, he, you know, you've got an idea and got a script. How can you make a film out of what's around you? And I just love that kind of filmmaking where he ended up making an amazing film, winning um, some some uh, film festivals with it or taking to film festivals, doing really well with it and then getting a lot of um, a lot of deals after that. And that film, I think, just whenever I watch it, I'm just like really interested by how basic you can be to make something um, that works really well as, as a whole narrative, as, an, as a whole story anyway. So, yeah. I think those kind of directors um, and so many more. I could I could spend absolutely ages just talking about films and details on films. So I won't go into too much detail. But definitely, all of those things uh, through the '90s, I'd say, were, were stuff that still sticks with me now. And then, in terms of like uh, gimbals and stuff or car rigs, do you have any like special equipment that you use? Um, I don't have tons of specialist stuff myself. I kind of. Uh, I, I'm always buying stuff to be fair. There's always new toys. That I'm like, oh, I need that, I need that. Um, the main thing I use for, for cars is my Ronin RS3. Um, so I've just got the RS3, I had the RS2 before that. The RS3 is really good. Um, and I've always used Ronins from the very first one. We had the Ronin, then we had the Ronin M. Um, and I've used the Ronin 2 a fair amount as well for, for bigger rigs. So using a red, I'll use the Ronin 2. And then for my A7S, uh, now I, I use an RS3, which um is yeah they're they're amazing like the technology on gimbals has come so far uh, and most of the time for tracking it would be just yeah holding that hanging out the back of a car and and shooting that way and then for shoots where it's possible i'll try and get a um an inspire 2 rig so a dji inspire 2 drone try and get a rig for that put that on the on on the front or the back of the car and then just chase and stuff i was in i was in sweden last week we were doing a lot of that we had uh, I was so I was driving. Um, someone else was operating the, the gimbal on the on the drone, and yeah, we were just chasing cars around a track, which was great fun. And you can get some amazing stuff with that. And I think uh, that's that's become quite a kind of the thing that people are using now. Is you know, if people have got the time and got the money, they'll use an Inspire to uh, just just suck it onto the side of a car because it's just you get unbelievably stable footage and it looks 
incredible like the lenses that they they put on them are really like really nice and sharp i know dji when they first announced that drone put out a video where it's like compared to an ari uh ari alexa uh mini and i was like okay well so, yeah you're matching those kind of colors uh yeah matching those cameras in the color uh, color grade then yeah it just sort of shows how good that camera is and i think it's just it's quick to set up and it can be operated with with very few people um compared to what you know big commercials use which would be russian arms and and things like that uh I've, I've always just like what can we what can we use the the basic kit and and get the most out of it so equally with with the drones i, I use the mavic 2 the dji mavic 2 if i'm just on my own i was in america at the beginning of the year and I, I didn't have a lot of kit with me so i had that which again you can just suck onto a car and get really cool tracking shots and, and chasing shots and you just it's it's only eight bits so you don't get quite as much as the inspire but it still looks really cool so yeah, those are those are my kind of hack hack rigs that, that I sometimes use. I don't have anything that's like uh, I don't have anything that looks professional, but the, the footage looks professional. But I don't have anything. If you looked at it, you go, "Is that a, that's a drone stuck onto your uh, onto your car?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, it's a drone, but it looks cool." So yeah, that's that's generally what we use. Yeah, I think I saw in your story. Like, was it Ben Cornish? Was he the guy setting up the? Yeah, so it's Ben's drone. So I think you, yeah. you'd spoke, spoken to Ben um, a few weeks before, and he he has a drone, and um, we were operating that. So we kind of went off. We had a bunch of different cars that we were shooting, doing tracking with and doing drifts with, and it was great. It was really good working with Ben. It's the first time I've worked with him, um, but it, I've spent a lot of time flying the Inspire and doing the same sort of stuff, and he obviously he owns that Inspire, and he's done it a lot. And so that was a really good dynamic working with Ben because we both – you know with me driving the tracking vehicle i know where he i kind of know where he's looking and where he wants the car to go and where, where he's going to end up and stuff and where the meeting points of the cars are so if we're doing um you know head-to-head -head jousts with something around a corner or things like that we're able to really easily get shots that um are really dynamic and really cool without you know without too much kind of blocking we kind of will we'll have an understanding of what we're trying to get and the same when we put it in the air to be fair we flew that as well i was flying and ben was getting um was on the drop i was on the gimbal and yeah we got some sick shots like that as well so i think that that was a really good one actually doing that with ben because it's it's always really nice working with someone who's like got a lot of experience using those bits of kit as well and really understands it in the head as to as to what you're going to get yeah because because he has he has the the mov max arm and like the different cameras and stuff but yeah, he said it's like not as stable and it's bigger and it's more set up time. So if you can have like the drone and just a few suction cups and you can kind of travel anywhere in the world and just strap it to any kind of car as well. So you see them like strapping it to the, the Bugattis and everything. So, yeah, I think I haven't seen any uh, like the the Mavic that you say you use. Do you have any like photos of that attached how you yeah that? i've got a few a few bits i can i can show you that essentially it's the most basic setup ever, ever so um so that's mavic 2 which has got the pretty decent hasselblad camera on it and then essentially <laughs> this is what i built from things from amazon so that's just two cheese plates um with a shock mount in between and you kind of just attach those two together so that just gives a little bit of of kind of takes a bit of the vibration off and then essentially the the Mavic will just strap onto that. So this is a Velcro strap. So the Mavic just sits on there on that Velcro strap. I've like I've taped some sponge onto the bottom of here as well to take out even more vibration. Uh, and it's a bit of a Frankenstein's monster sort of thing. But yeah, there's just a few mounting points there, and that literally just goes onto a car like that. And you can put it you can put it absolutely anywhere, and um, it's pretty secure. I think I have about three suckers holding on usually. Sometimes two if I'm feel, if I'm feeling lucky and that that gets really cool shots it's really cool for, uh, for for chasing stuff so obviously a lot of the time when we're filming we're just hanging out the back with a with a gimbal you can't do that out of the front very easily unless you have a car with um with with uh with an engine in the back so i've done that with a nine with a 911 actually a porsche 911 you take the bonnet off and you just sit in the front which is great fun and kind of terrifying but the the mavic's much better for that where you can kind of yeah just stick it on the front of something and just chase it it's surprise it's really surprising how smooth that is as well um if you're on like pretty good roads i mean the uk the, the roads in the uk are are terrible but um it's still been pretty good and it's just really quick to set up so that was when i was in america beginning of the year i went in with very very little kit so that was just an easier thing to take and you can you literally just leave it on you can drive through towns and stuff and it's you're you're controlling the gimbal on your phone 
So he's just using touch screen just to just to move it around and stuff. And yeah, you get some really cool shots with that. So that's that's sort of my um, my backup cheap uh, cheap hack setup. But it is it works great for most things. To be fair, yeah, because I've got the DJI Mini Pro Three. It's only a small one, and yeah, I was like, oh, I'm gonna use it, and then I turned it on without it flying, and it only lasts like a minute or so. I think it like has a, a overheat or something, and just shuts off. Because I used to I used to have the uh, DJI Phantom Four or something, and that would I could strap that on, but it's just like too wide, and the image isn't that good. But I think they get it; they got better over time. The image quality improved, especially. But frustrating. The the I use the two. I have a Mavic Three, which is the next one up. But the they 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 kind of took away the control to move the gimbal as much. So I think you can move it maybe 20 degrees left and right whereas on that one you can move it almost 180 degrees on its own axis so everyone still uses the two and when the three came out everyone was like really annoyed that they can do it as well because the three is three is that extra step up right it's 10 bit it's it's you know you can get the city package which shoots prores 42 and stuff so that's frustrating and also it's got the zoom lens on the on the three which doesn't have it on the two but um yeah i think with each of these at the end of the day we're using drones to strap on the side of cars. I think DJI are probably sat there just being like, "Oh well, yes, not it's not meant to do that." So <laughs> we can't really we can't really get annoyed at DJI for like not giving us the features to to use their product in the wrong way. But it is also really good in the wrong way. Yeah, like I think everybody's kind of waiting for them just to create a box with a gimbal on it that you can kind of just strap anywhere. Like because they did it with the 4D, but that's kind of like our eight to ten thousand dollars where it's like it doesn't need to be that much but i guess that's kind of what it costs so you can get like inspire 2s pretty cheap nowadays like second hand so i think that's kind of the way i've been looking at them like on the different kind of second hand platforms trying to find one they're about four thousand dollars right now but i think because the inspire 3 is like sixteen thousand like us it's kind of like well that's like the next step yeah, and that's true, it's 8K and everything. But yeah, that's kind of like the... Surprised with DJI, because I mean, they had, you know, they had the, um, they kind of, they're, they're, they're kind of a fine company. They do all of this lower end stuff um, that's more consumer focused. And then they do some stuff that's like super high end commercial focus. And there's almost like this missing space in the middle. And they try and like, they kind of put a few of their drones in there with like the Mavic 3 and Mavic 3 Pro and like the DJI RS2 Pro or FYI RS3 Pro as opposed to like the, the more consumer ones. But when they had, you know, they have the, D the X7 camera on the Inspire 2 and that camera where you're like, surely you can just put that, like take that camera and just put it on something much smaller. And they kind of did it with the 4D, but then the 4D is like this whole other thing with like, it's chicken head and it's lidar and all of this other bits and it's kind of it's almost too much the other way it's like i kind of want something in the middle that's i can put that camera on a smaller like just box brain sort of thing i think I was talking to ben and he was like oh you know he's he's going to take his inspired two and rip all the arms off it and just make it like a very slim thing with a bunch of cheese plates on it which makes sense if you, if you don't fly it um but yeah dji is kind of missing this this one space that everyone's sort of hungry for i think um so maybe eventually ho hopefully they're working on it now a lot of manufacturers they don't really listen to the filmmakers because i guess it comes to money as well because it's like why would we create a camera that's perfect because then you won't buy the next one and then the next one. it's like they keep making things like <laughs> it's like uh yeah, so everyone's like, oh, it's not quite the perfect camera yet. They keep messing it about. But um, so the next thing, are there any like projects that you've done that you can kind of like talk a little bit about? Yeah, Spirit of the Spirit of the Ride. It was a passion project. Um, so this film, this one's an interesting one because it is a passion project, but it was a it was more of a um, it, it was more of a spec film than anything because it was used specifically to get work from triumph motorcycles so uh when i was working for my my, my last company we got invited to pitch for uh to work for triumph motorbikes and we need i we kind of were like well we need to show them that we know how to film bikes we've been filming cars for for so many years we want to show them how we film bikes so we kind of came up with an idea and luckily when i say it, luckily it's very weird 
one of my colleagues who worked in the office with me, his grandfather had come third in the Isle of Man TT back in 1969, I think. And straight away, I kind of remember, he, he told me about this like a few um, a few years before. Uh, and then like as we were doing this this pitching and this treatment stuff, I kind of thought, oh, that could, that could be an interesting like angle for us to take on this, that we make it a bit of a mini documentary. And so we we i kind of sold that to my boss at the time i sort of said oh you know i've got this idea make a mini documentary about my friend's granddad um we were obviously my well, electronic know that is his granddad um but we'll, we'll make this film and we'll try and make it kind of to show that we know how to film motorbikes and so that film ended up i i really enjoyed that film um it was there was no budget for it i think the comp we we paid to hire a circuit in the uk um called cadwell park which is a, a famous motorbike circuit in the uk um and we we hired that i think for an hour it was it was not a long period of time and it was like a thousand pounds for an hour and we i had a very detailed shot list and storyboard i knew exactly what we needed to do and we, we it was very much okay we've got an hour to get all of this riding stuff so that whole film and if anytime you see a bike drive like riding fast around that circuit on its own that was shot in that period of time and that was so that was again you saying oh how do you do all this truck you know how do you use rigs and things i was like that rig was was literally me hanging out the back of a volkswagen passat uh a, a volkswagen a diesel volkswagen passat with um my boss who is a racing driver driving it so he definitely got the most out of that car and i was in the back holding a movi pro um which i'd rented and a we had our red epic w on it with canon cine lenses um in fact actually it might have been zoom lenses on that one just to make it easier i can't remember if we put maybe some fuji on zooms or something on there um but essentially i was i was just strapped into the back i had a helmet on and i had ratchet straps i had a normal harness and a uh, a ready rig coming off as well to take the weight of the ronin and multiple ratchet straps just going in different places just to stop me from moving side to side because usually when we do that we kind of just sit in there we put one harness on and we we don't go that fast we'll probably go maybe max will go is about 40 miles an hour around a corner 60 miles an hour in a straight line and if you wedge yourself with your foot on one side you can kind of make you know you can kind of deal with that g-force but with this one it was like well we're trying to show a bike going as fast as we can so my boss who was a racing driver was going for it like he was really like uh probably got the fastest lap time in a vw passat around that circuit ever and it was just me like, hanging out the back and i had my colleagues um one on a uh on the focus so we had two monitors sat up in the back one person doing focus and the other person had a playstation 4 controller doing the movie control so i was literally just there to hold it and to go up and to go down so depending on like whether we wanted low or high and then yeah we kind of had comms to each other we but it was mostly just yelling at each other and just again it was one of those things where we planned out the shots beforehand we sort of knew what we wanted there um and and yeah we just made the most of that that period of time that we had uh so that was a really fun shoot just doing that part of it and then another part of it was going and actually filming um the the guy who's in it this guy could um daryl pendlebury i don't know you have to show it on screen i can't remember his name um i think it's daryl and that was yeah i i kind of had written out this script as to what i kind of wanted the film to be and i wanted it to be about you know he used to be a, a triumph test test rider as well so he used to test all their, their bikes he used to ride the isle of man tt the isle of man tt for those who don't know is like the craziest motorbike race in the world like you see the videos of people just like going 200 miles an hour on these country lanes uh so like it's not for the faint-hearted um and i think people who ride motorbikes that fast anyway are a little bit strange in the head anyway so um it was like oh what can we we want to show like what it's like to be right on the edge um and so it's one of those interviews where i was like there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of older people i think kind of don't really care about this stuff like you know as a filmmaker you're like i want to get emotion out of something i want to like make it like really emotional and like say something that's going to be, be like captivating to an audience but when you're asking questions to someone like in a real situation about like so what's it like riding a motorbike when you're like you're right on there you're, you're so close to falling off and they're just like yeah it's all right so just just sort of hold on and you're like yeah yeah but like it's, it must be like so difficult where you're like you know you're, you're millis like millimeters from falling off and you're right on the edge of everything and trying to get like answers out of them so that interview i ended up we ended up filming it um quite a long interview where i was asking quite a lot of stuff and feeding him some lines as well 
and feeding him lies is really difficult. So the edit that you see is that's a lot of editing of, of what he says. It's me picking words and putting words together to try and make it sound more dramatic than it does. Um, and I think after I cut that first sort of bit, I felt there was something missing and we needed more repertage of this guy kind of just in, in, in a different environment. So there was a, there was a motorbike race on that same uh, circuit, like the following weekend. So we just went with him back. There was uh, me and my colleague went, just took a, took the red in a backpack, snuck in, um, without any permissions and just shot him walking around a bit. So those kind of the three elements of that film, but I really liked how that film ended out, uh, how it turned out with, you know, not having really a client to deal with, apart from um, my boss who was paying for it, and having an in, what I thought was an interesting idea, um, and just doing something a bit different, and just kind of like really having a plan of like what are we going to do to make this different and make it cool, and yeah, I really like how that film turned out, and Triumph did as well because we got we got the job from that. Um, so yeah, that was my kind of first foray into motorbikes. I've, I've done quite a lot of motorbike stuff since then, which is always fun because they are cool. Um, I'm not allowed to ride them. My, my mum won't let me ride them, so <laughs> I, I film them instead. It's, it's, uh, it's just as dangerous sometimes. But yeah, that, that one was really cool. Oh, and then what was the the um, video that you kind of like won, or was there like a series? Like there's parts and accessories or boner. Ville, Baba, was that those things? So, the yeah. So the main thing it was for was for their press rise. So to essentially go and support journalists on on um, on launches of new bikes around the world. Um, they kind of do them for a few weeks uh, uh, around uh, like across the winter usually. So that was the main thing to do was to be the supplier for all of that as a company, and um, that was great fun. So the Bonneville. The Bonneville film is one of those films that we'd make on site. Essentially, we'd turn up and have two days to film lots of B-roll of the bike, uh, of this new bike in the location, and then also make a hero film out of that. So maybe like a 60 second film to show to the press, the journalists when they turn up to just get them excited about the ride. So we'd always kind of, that was always good fun. Cause again, th these are sort of projects where like, you don't have a massive brief. It's just kind of like make the, make the bike look cool make the location look cool, make the roads look really cool. So you kind of had a bit of um, carte blanche for just being able to just come in with fresh ideas and make sure that you're, you know, we're always making sure we're getting footage that can be used by journalists as well, because we're giving them um, a lot of this stuff to use in their own edits. But then you're always also shooting extra stuff just for this hero for your film, just for this like teaser film that you're going to show uh, the journalists. And that would also then end up going up on YouTube. So that was kind of the main thing we do with them. And then I've done, yeah, I have done a few other projects with them. One of them being, I think it's on my Vimeo, the, the genuine parts and accessories thing. And again, that was just Triumph wanting to advertise, essentially when it wants to get people to come and buy um, genuine parts and genuine accessories from them. So that was a uh, an idea that I like, I'd come up with to do a lot of match cuts between sort of footage in the factory of them building stuff and um, footage of the bikes being used, so the actual accessories being used, and this kind of through line we had almost, yeah, um, from the initial concept and design all the way through to um, the manufacturing and the production of it and the testing, and it was kind of, it told a story all the way through that, and we I'd kind of pitched to them to have this character um, just in, in a garage, just tinkering with his bike and going out for a ride. So you kind of you, you kind of putting this, um, yeah. The, the viewer is this actor essentially when they're watching it, I guess. Um, so that ended up being really nice. The thing it was again, it was shot over a very short period of time, edited in a very short period of time. But they, yeah, they used this for for quite a few little things like that as well. So it was never never like a massive commercial. They they um, they have a different agency that that dealt with all of that. But we were trying our best to tread on their toes the whole time, I think, and, and sort of like, yeah, do stuff that was still cool. Well, the the iRacing thing on there is interesting because that's that's very much a product of like working in COVID. So obviously in COVID, suddenly you can go out and film anything. So that was, um, I ended up doing a fair amount of projects within uh, it, within games, essentially filming stuff from games. So iRacing is a, is a driving game that a lot of manufacturers started using to promote their own events and do their own events in. I ended up filming a bunch of stuff for a um, 
an esports client last year and i thought I'd, I'd got all this footage and i had my pc set up to run it and i had a playstation 5 controller plugged in so i could move the camera around and get really cool shots so i thought i'll just put a show all together for that to show what kind of can be done and it was really like it's really cool kind of like using that software because you can open up the settings and you can change your f-stop on the camera you can change the time of day you do all kinds of things so it's quite a cool way just like to experiment and just play around with um with footage of just cars right like racing and just putting the camera really interesting places so that's quite that was quite fun to do um the aston martin fuji race overview this is an example this is one example of what i used to do a lot of i don't i don't do this for aston martin anymore they've got um but i think they've got someone else doing it but when i worked in my old company essentially i used to go to the world endurance championship with both porsche and aston martin and um that's what that's what Le Mans is part of the world endurance championship so it's that series and these they do six hour races in much places so that's very much event filming um you're embedded with the team so with Aston Martin it was it was good because it's a British team um really got on with the drivers there and we were making social films with them throughout the weekend and then sort of these these overview films out of everything you'd shot and again that kind of stuff is really cool because you've you've not got a massive brief it's what can you do and and um how can you be creative and make this more exciting than bear in mind like they would not always win and most of the time didn't win so you kind of try and make it really exciting try and make it really uh yeah engaging for people to watch um and you end up competing with other people who are there as well as far as you know in a friendly way everyone's trying to make really cool stuff out of all that you know whatever brand they're working for so um they're really hard work doing those kind of things and something like Le Mans 24 or Nürburgring 24 or Spa 24 they're really really hard races to film there you are filming for a long period of time um and making stuff all the time so they're hard work but it can't like and it is one of those things when you finish them you're like yeah that was really good i'm really happy with what i managed to shoot but it's very much run and gun whatever you can find whatever you can get to be creative and then is there like a a tight turnaround they want to like see it the same day or the next day or yeah so all, all of that stuff on on race weekends is very fast turnaround so you're for the social films you might be putting out two social films a day where they might be a 30 to 60 second sort of film, which doesn't sound like a lot, but there's always little elements to that. And you're splitting that time. If you think about race weekends, you've got on most days, you've got two free practice sessions, which are about an hour long. So you kind of want to be out trackside for that to get as much footage as you can of your cars going in different corners and finding the best corners as well. Um, you've also got garage sessions to try and get footage of, of mechanics putting tires on, on cars and, and whatever's happening in the garage drivers getting in drivers getting into their race suits and getting in cars so within in between all of that you're editing as well so you're kind of going out filming coming back and editing um the race overview films so that one that's on that's on there they yeah that's kind of the race day which is saturday your which is a six hour race so you kind of you won't start editing until probably two uh, two to three hours into the race you'll film the any kind of general views of the area so if you're at mount fuji you like we went out and shot Mount Fuji like beforehand I think we quite often go and spend time and find a color that shows the the location so in Japan we'd find temples or koi carp ponds and and um mountains and things and pepper that into the film as well to kind of get a real idea of the location and then you're filming the grids the grid kind of set up so the cars get on the grid and everyone gets ready and there's a big you know there's there's people playing drums in that one I think and um there's always some sort of party sort of thing they put on at the grid so you're just trying to get as much of that as possible you're very much like what am I, what can i get that's going to look cool in the edit um and try not to shoot everything in slow motion because you kind of do also like fall into habit of just being like this is going to look sick in slow motion but yeah trying to get a mix and then yeah you've got the start of the race shoot as much of that as you can and then you kind of probably will come back to edit a bit of that try and get as much down as you can before you kind of stop filming the end of the race you make sure you get a few pit stops in there you make sure you get a few driver changes in there if a car crashes you might need to include that in an edit but a very subtle kind of like you know oh no we crashed uh close the cl closing the garage door or something and not make a big thing out of it but as always you know you're you're trying to make this film and also watch the screen so the race once the race finishes you're trying to deliver that about two hours after the race is finished so that's fully color graded with music with um all your sound effects as well done so it's it's just a case of trying to keep up to it you don't want to you don't want to get to the end of the race and have nothing done on your timeline because you'll have shot way more probably than you need and it'll take ages to look through it all i think that's also another really important thing with those things is not overshooting and knowing like what 
just about what you need because you can get really carried away with especially on a, on a corner you imagine like you start on a corner of a, of, of a circuit and you you kind of pick the first bit of it and you slowly work your way around but it's really easy to every three meters think oh is this a better shot than the last one i got and just like keep keep kind of trying to get it and you kind of need to just be very confident just to be like no i've got that shot i just need i need something different that's going to cut in with something else here or something that i've just shot so um it's a bit of kind of yeah you, you, you're trying to think of the edit the whole time you're shooting which is why it helps to to be someone who edits a lot as well um of your own footage because yeah you're always kind of thinking that in the back of your mind so what's it like working with like professional athletes like you know daniel ricardo like what what was that experience like yeah um daniel ricardo that was quite a few years ago now um when he was still at red bull i think is he's back at red bull i can't keep up with formula one to be fair is I, I i i watched like drive survivor uh i think the first two seasons and i'm like okay yeah i get it it's all just rich people complaining um but he was really good he was a really really nice guy i think most people who have worked with him say it's a really nice guy and i think that's the thing like some of these talents um there's kind of this fear that goes around with them from from their pr team or from whoever's working with them that like you know they're this they're this golden god that you like have to be really careful around um most of them are really nice people daniel was really nice lewis hamilton was um r really easy to work with again he's done this so many times he knows like how it flows he you know all of these guys just want it to be a fast and efficient and to not you know mess them around a little you know too much and and waste their time so um i think with 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 those kind of guys with both daniel ricardo and lewis hamilton that was a case of making sure that they were coming to shoot something that they would actually enjoy doing and for both of them like it was it was a bit of fun for them for lewis he got to drive around in this new 4x4 um uh just for the whole day with with the the guy who owned it um so he he obviously like was happy just to mess around in this car that wasn't his and he didn't worry about braking so it made really good footage in that sense it was a nightmare to shoot it because he would just drive off and disappear and go and do his own thing and we'd be like okay i don't know if any of the cameras in that car are running and i don't know where they've gone and i don't know if we, like if we're going to see them again but we had like we had a whole day with lewis to shoot all of his in-car bits and all his talking all his reactions and then we had a second day just to shoot the car and b-roll of the car to lay over that so we kind of we'd, we'd made sure we weren't trying to do too much at once because yeah there was there was definitely the uh the chance that that would happen that he would just want to do something different to what we planned but i think with with most of these um these kind of bigger stars bigger celebrities it's just yeah it's very dependent on what they're like and what they're used to and what mood what mood they're in like sometimes they're just like they're just they just can't be asked and they just want to get it done with and get out of there um, and other times they're like really happy to do stuff for you and do stuff multiple times um so yeah it's always like it's always nice it's always like a bit of a privilege getting to work with some of these like really talented people in in uh motorsport but yeah i think it's 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 always a bit different each time and you just kind of need to not like get worked up luckily i'm not like a massive fan of of these people so i've never like fangled really hard at them and and um you know been lost words or anything like that and i've worked with a lot of football players as well from um from big clubs here in the uk and never i've never been a football fan so i don't care like these people who are like a lot of people i know would would you know fall at their knees in front of i'm like yeah he's he's right um so i think that helps i don't really care about them too much um and yeah i'm there to do a job and as far as i'm concerned they're there, they're there to do a job as well and i think like sometimes people will be divas and you just got to deal with it if they're you know like at the end of the day they're, they're they've been brought on because of who they are you kind of just need to accept who they are a little bit yeah so do you think it's important to kind of have a plan and kind of have everything planned out so that you're utilizing the time like effectively because i know like a lot of celebrities or professionals they don't give you much time they say oh, i'm only like here for a certain amount of time so you have to kind of grab the shots that you need like quickly yeah so the the most of these um celebrities or, or sports people in general <clears throat> when they've got sponsorship uh, sponsorship deals they've probably got an hour to do whatever sponsorship thing that they need to do so um with with like lewis he actually was there for most of the day but i think that's because he kind of was happy to be 
but definitely with Daniel Ricardo, we I think we had him for an hour and that was filming for Aston Martin, but they had a partnership with Red Bull. So the Red Bull sponsorship gave him one, gave us one hour of his time. So in that sense, yeah, you're like, you're planning it to the absolute minute beforehand with your producer, um, trying to think of what is absolutely necessary to get, what is going to take, what, how much time is this going to take? What could go wrong? Do we need some buffer here or buffer here? And also just having enough crew to be able to manage that. So quite often when we're doing those um, those bits of planning and those shot lists, I'll have every you know I'll have all of my camera operators that I'm going to have there on the shoot, and I'm trying to just make sure that they're doing you know they've got something to do, and it's really clear in the plan that we go over the day before or on that morning and just say this is you know at this point this is what you're doing, and everyone's got that really clear idea because once that person arrives and they start getting mic'd up, it's all hands on deck and you you kind of, everyone just needs to know exactly what they're doing for the next hour that we've got them. Um, so yeah, planning is is probably the most important when you've got like something like that, where it's a very, very short period of time that you've just got to get it perfect. And what was the, the Lewis Hamilton, what were they selling? Like, what was the brand in, in EOS? Is that the car or is that, what is that? So Ineos, yeah, they've, um, so Ineos are one of the main sponsors of Mercedes F1 team. And they are a company and they're a UK company. They're one of the biggest UK companies. Um, and they make chemicals. As, uh, uh, that's what they started out doing to make chemicals. But they've also decided to make a four by four, which is essentially an homage to the Land Rover Defender, which Land Rover discontinued a few years ago before they brought out the new one. So they kind of, yeah, the owner of that company, one of the richest people in the UK was sort of like, well, why don't I build my own Land Rover vendor, but I won't, I'll call it something different. So that's what they built. And Lewis is obviously an ambassador of that because of the sponsorship, uh, sponsorship deal. So they kind of did a series of films of different people driving that car as it went through development. And Lewis was one of the people um, who came and did that. And they've done, they've done other films with Lewis. They've done films with um, Valtteri Bottas when he was at Mercedes and George Russell, um, now he's with Mercedes as well. So they they kind of build a bit of a series out of that. And it's mainly just to, to go on our excitement for this new car, which um, launched a few months ago, I think. I've seen a few of them on the UK uh, roads. But yeah, it was it was to promote that new car, essentially. Because it looks exactly like the Land Rover. That's why I was like, what is it? <laughs> a bit wider. Like when you look at it, like in person, it's like the proportions are a bit different. But yeah, if you just glance at it, it's, it looks like an old Land Rover Defender. But it's definitely a bit bigger. Okay. And then what about like the Aston Martin racing new Vantage teaser or is there like another one? The new Vantage teaser, that was, um, that's a teaser for a longer documentary that I did when they, when Aston Martin retired the old, um, the old Vantage and they were bringing out the new one, which would have been in, I think it's probably 2018 or something like that. Um, maybe a bit later, but they, they essentially were trying to build the new car, the new road car in tandem with a new race car. So usually what you do is you build your road car and then you go to a race team and say, this is the road car. You just, you need to make it look like this, but obviously anything else can be completely different the engine or whatever is underneath it. Um, but for this, Aston Martin wanted to try and show that they were building them together to show that there was synergy and, and DNA exchange between the two cars. So we got asked if we could make a documentary of that whole thing um and that was really good that was like a good project in a lot of ways in in a lot of ways as well it was very difficult to again plan it and to make sure we were available um to to well to make sure that we were invited to shoot important parts so um i went and shot you know the design team doing cad designs and then we went back and shot them putting sh the chassis together um on the race car eventually we ended up filming i sent another crew to go and shoot in sebring I think they did testing for it. So we got some test footage from Sebring and then eventually it ends up um, doing its first race, which would have been at Silverstone um, for the w, uh, for the World Endurance Championship and then eventually went on to Le Mans. Uh, so that was a really good, that was a really good project. I think it was about a 20 minute documentary in total that we ended up making. But there was also bits of it which were quite frustrating of like not always having access when you wanted it and always having to wait for Aston Martin to say, oh, we're doing this thing. Do you want to come and film it so you can put it in your documentary? And actually rather having to be like, guys, can you like tell us when you're doing stuff? Because we need to make this documentary. Um, so there's enough in there to make that film. But I think there's probably like a lot of these things that we've tried to do before that are similar. 
there's always like a bit of a missing chunk here and there where you're suddenly like you know they're building a car and then you skip and you're like now they're testing it and you're like well, what happened in between there and it's like, well we just we just don't always have the access or there's not the budget to like really do each st uh, each stage like that but yeah that was that was a pretty long film um over a lot of months and the edit was yeah took quite a while to put together but i think yeah it turn turned out quite nicely in the end yeah i think that's one of the hardest things about documentaries is getting that access especially with like a manufacturer where it's all kind of top secret and you know it's like how do you get invited to things all the time like constantly you know if it's not the like the project that you're 100 percent committed to for two years or whatever it's like you know you're going to be doing other projects and then if they ring you up and say we do you want to come tomorrow it's like oh okay like yeah it sounds like seems like difficult thing and then the what about the valhalla versus valkyrie what was the story behind that one the valhalla versus valkyrie was essentially aston martin decided to um so well at Le Mans, they changed some of the rules and allowed you to bring a, uh, they created a class which they called a hypercar class, which was in order to encourage more teams to get into, um, to compete in the top class at Le Mans. And Aston Martin were one of the first people who said, yes, we're going to do this, we're going to build a car, um, and we're going to make a road car version of it as well. And <clears throat> they started development on it, and then eventually the, you know, they, they decided to cut that project, that entire program and uh, focus on Formula One. Obviously, it didn't get completely cut because the Valkyrie has now become the, the AMR Valkyrie road car, which um, is like all over YouTube now. Uh, and also the AMR Pro, which is the race, is the track version of it, but it's not a race car. Like, what is it in? Like, it, it doesn't have any race series to race in. The new 911 um, made of what you love. Like, was that like CGI, like the, the blue light lines? Like, how did you do that? Like, what was the story behind that one? The, the new 911 GT3, that was, again, it's a race car. So Porsche will, will you know, Porsche build and sell their own race cars as well as road cars. Um, and the GT3 is widely used by lots of teams around, around the world. There's lots of series that race GT3s uh and they, so they had this new one and this was a brief that came over from an agency in germany um who they knew that we were going to go and film it and they gave us this brief which was essentially this car they do a camouflage livery when they do motorsport well when they do any car they do a camouflage livery this camouflage livery had lots of circuits from all over the world um sort of like hidden in the pattern um Kind of like morphed into it so you have you know you had Le Mans and you had Laguna Seca or, or Nürburgring all these things that if you looked closely you could see these these circuits so the brief was essentially that to, to shoot b-roll of the car um, and then they would or we were going to then put VFX to highlight these these circuits and match that in with racing footage again that was a little bit that that shoot ended up being um just us shooting it in the evening the car was at a test so we didn't have that much control we managed to get maybe an hour and a half with it in the evening to shoot those those details of it with the that we could then put the blue light over and then what about like the Porsche guy Berryman yeah he um he, he's really rich and has lots of cool cars um and Porsche like got in contact with him to do this to do this branded piece um with his original classic 911 which i don't know what year that's from um it looks it looks quite original it looks quite old as one of, it'd be one of the first years of it um but that was yeah it was a nice film again trying to do something cinematic and all shot on red um the interview ended up being really nice with him he was very eloquent in the way he spoke i was really happy with how we'd how we'd set up that interview framing as well and then we we're able to get out on the road with him and, and again do do tracking um <clears throat> there wasn't a lot of roads the, the uk is really difficult to find roads that you can go out and film on in my experience we've got a lot of very narrow roads with with hedges all the way down and they're they're not kind of perfect for this sort of stuff so where he lives as well is a very quaint part of england but it's not got good filming roads really so we're just going up and down this one this one piece of road just to get stuff to go over his his interview so yeah it turned out to be a really nice film um with yeah just his interview and then b-roll of, of the car and and footage of him stroking his car which is always fun whenever you like whenever you're filming someone like this and you're like 
you, you're trying to make them you're, you're, you're shooting b-roll to go over them talking about how much they love their car and so you're like filming them being like could you do you mind just like stroking it um and like it, it's weird and awkward in person but you're like don't worry it, it looks good in the edit but like if you, if you watch films with cars in them and there's people just watch how many times they stroke their cars because I've never done it to my own one, but in commercials, everyone's stroking cars and stroking seats and stroking all kinds of things. So yeah, that's always fun doing stuff like that. There's one on your Vimeo um, just called Porsche Icons. Like that's pretty cool. Like what's the story behind that one? So Porsche Icons was a, <clears throat> a film simply to promote buying, uh, uh, to promote Porsche owners, people who have classic 911s or just, um, second-hand 911s to uh, second-hand Porsches to go and buy genuine parts and accessories and um, just things directly from Porsche for their car so the brief was quite open like they were gonna they were building a new website that they were gonna have all of these parts listed on and they just wanted to film to go along with it and the client I was working for was really open to creative ideas and so I kind of I think I built a mood film and pitched um, pitched in this idea of just two two Porsche owners who just take their cars out for a, for a drive say on, on a Saturday or a Sunday or something and it's, it's very much focused on the driving experience why you would have a car like this what's the point of having a car like this it wasn't meant to be too product heavy I didn't want it to be like go to this website to buy this thing now it's like if we can just get the products in there in a really subtle way um, but the emotion is what is, is the main thing that's going to be in there the story is what's the main thing so that film we shot it in we shot it mostly in one day well first off we shot half a day in a garage which was the guy tinkering with his car so he's got that beautiful blue 911 um that he was you know pretending to to do things with and pretends and pretends that he actually like maintains it and and changes things on it and then the rest of the film is him with a friend in his um in his 911 driving around the peak district in the uk which is a beautiful national park area that we have here really nice roads there um and it's just meant to be that it's just meant to be the emotion of that and within all of that is peppered these kind of product shots and this voiceover narration which is all about icons and what makes something an icon and the idea behind that and that script and this is maybe where we like we, we do lean into pretentiousness which is really hard but also does you know something pretentious with a good emotional music under it and nice cinema uh, cinematography does make you feel stuff and i think that whole idea was the 911 is all of these different parts and taking you know you take these parts away and it doesn't mean anything but if it all comes together in the right in the right way that's your porsche 911 which is an which is a iconic car one of the most iconic cars and so that's what the whole script is talking about is you know all of the bits and essentially it's saying you need to keep your 911 absolutely perfect by buying all of these really expensive parts from us uh in order to to keep it an icon which is what it's essentially saying to you um but it was really cool to film all of that stuff again like just without working with actors is always great and the product shots that you see flashed in there that's that's just me um in a, just later on just out in a home studio just shooting different products that, that porsche had given me that i could shoot so it's just a, a turntable um so set uh, set up a red with a turntable some light painting and just lots of close-up details and things like that i could pepper throughout and there's blueprints as well in there that i pepper throughout which just kind of help the energy of the film and keep parking back to what it's actually talking about which is um buying parts for, for your car so that was really nice on the film the beginning of that shoot was not very fun because i'd initially just uh, planned to shoot a lot of stuff with the inspire 2 from the air and we did a lot of the tracking first so what i was saying before about putting the inspire 2 on a, on a car and following it and doing tracking with that that's what we done originally got both the cars like a lot of tracking of both cars i was happy with that i wanted to get some aerial shots put the drone in the air and was getting i think the only like the only shot we ended up getting but filming the cars as they came down this lovely rolling hill between all of these all of these trees in this big forest and i was stupidly flying it but looking at what the camera was seeing because my colleague was was operating the camera and i you get excited when you see a really cool shot because you're like that's sick yeah yeah keep going keep going keep going um and it turns out i was a little bit too low down and the trees were a little bit too high up and we ended up 
<clears throat> well, I ended up just parking the drone at the top of a very, very tall tree in the middle of this peak, in the middle of this national park at the very beginning of a shoot. And um, no way of getting it down whatsoever. So we just had, I was just like, all right, we'll deal with that later. Leave the drone in the in the tree. We'll go and shoot the rest of the film. I'll figure out how to get it back. And so that whole shoot, I was like, we were shooting it and it was going well. But the whole time I was thinking, there's a ten thousand pound drone in a tree, like a few miles away, um, that we just left and it started to rain. So we ended up getting that drone back. I talked to um, Al Clark and he crashed the Inspire One, the first Inspire One, and that's where he got the idea of strapping it to his car. So because oh, he couldn't fly it. Yeah, so I think that's the first, well, he claims to be the first person to do the Inspire on the car. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. But the one that we can talk about next is Porsche Road to the Runway. So that's kind of like a mix between a fashion film and a, a car film. Like, what's the story behind that one? Yeah, so Road to the Runway, um, like you said, it was it was a collaboration with a fashion designer. Porsche just announced the um the Taycan Cross Turismo which is their sort of compact I don't know what you'd call what they call it it's an electric car um compact estate compact SUV I don't know what you call it <clears throat> but essentially they wanted to do a few collaborations with different artists that would appeal to a younger millennial audience I guess and um this fashion designer Ali Walia was one of the the kind of people they chose and so the film was meant to be pretty base, basic and straightforward. It was very much led by her narration um, that was scripted by another agency, and we were there to sort of film that and bring that to life. So uh, two days, three days of filming, um, one day filming in the countryside. Um, so this, this, we had shots of her driving the car. I think she only drove it maybe for like 500 feet or so. Every, every, the rest of the time it's in footage of someone else driving. Um, but we didn't need a lot, which was kind of good. And like we did, we didn't need to overshoot the car. We could focus on getting nice stuff. And then the cooler part of the shoot for me was was in this forest that we we'd um, we'd booked, which is this really cool forest. They shot they've shot a load of different movies there. They shot a bit of Star Wars, um, one of the new three ones. They shot some of that there as well. So it's this really overgrown, old looking forest. Um, looks very like yeah, like old world Lord of the Rings or something. And so we had the models in there with this smoke machine and all this light. Um, most of the shots you see, there's a couple of shots in there which are like much slower tracking shots. They're all done with Inspire 2 with me flying it in this really wooded area, um, which was, yeah, that was fun, but also kind of like, that's definitely what I wasn't watching the monitor. I, was, I had like every eye on that drone because there's all these sticks and branches and stuff sticking out. And I'm like being so, so careful. And obviously, when you're flying something like a, a quite a big drone like that, um, it does kick up a lot of turbulence. And so when you're flying low and near to things, you never really know how it's going to react. And so you're kind of like trying to second guess a little bit. If like if I fly, you know, those are there's these two branches that were just about wide enough for it to go through. And so I'm like, if I fly through there, is that going to create any turbulence that throws it off in a way that I'm not expecting? And also flying in these tree covers, I didn't have GPS. So flying it completely manually which makes it like a little bit harder as well um to to do smooth motion but the the footage you know looking really cool all of that stuff was really cool um and yeah the film film came together well um it was very much planned out by by porsche and by an agency beforehand that it was storyboarded like very very specifically they knew exactly what the sequence was going to be so there wasn't a lot of creative freedom with that one i'd say um we got a lot more shots and a lot more footage than is used in that final edit. I've got, I think I did a director's cut myself, which uses a lot of other stuff and has different pacing, which I prefer as a film. Um, but that was this, the final one is definitely the one that they, they'd kind of planned out from the start and wanted to do. And that was just to launch this, this partnership with this fashion designer. So yeah, I think that turned out quite well. It's not quite a shot in that and really cool shooting in, in some of those locations as well. Are there any projects that you're working on in the future that you can talk about or are there any things that you kind of want to focus on? Like what kind of goals do you have for your like now moving forward? Yeah, there's probably 
uh, projects that I'm working on at the moment, or, or um, I do a lot of work at the moment for Top Gear magazine, who are the, you know, the, they're the YouTube channel for Top Gear essentially. And at the moment, they're not shooting the TV show, so we're doing a lot of um, a lot of films on YouTube for that. So I spend a lot of time working on their stuff and editing stuff for them at the moment. Um, so next few months, got a lot of trips away to going to Italy, going to Barcelona, going to Japan. Um, and yeah, then a bunch of other trips. So a lot of a lot of what I've got coming up is just flying to different places and filming in different places for people like Top Gear magazine. Do you film the on the Sony cameras for the Top Gear stuff? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So just what, again, everyone's the same, and Ben Cornish is the same as well. He's got all the same equipment. He does a lot of the same stuff I do in that sense for for them. He works for a lot of other brands as well. Um, so. Yeah, it's quite all the crews that come and do that stuff are all on the same cameras and all edit their own stuff. So we go. And, we were in Sweden last week shooting a lot of different things. We've all come away with a few films that we need to edit. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, you're, you're constantly juggling your edits and also going and shooting more stuff and things like that. So they, they definitely keep me busy. Um, I think now that I'm freelance, there was this there's this stage where you, you first start working for yourself, where you're kind of just saying yes to everything. You're taking on as much work as possible. Um, and I've been very lucky that ever since I've been freelance, I haven't ever had to look for work. I, I said I've, I've got a lot of contacts um, who do the same thing that I do and who uh, and clients as well who need people like me. And Automotive, I think, is one of the best spaces to be in at the moment for this kind of branded content because they're always making cars, they're always going to make cars <clears throat> and they always need films about them and content about them. Um, I, I think that's helped me a lot to be as busy as I've been and to keep as much work as I have. And I, I haven't needed to say, uh, haven't needed to say yes to everything, but I have said yes to most things and gone on most shoots and sort of done done shoots that have been really enjoyable and shoots that haven't been as enjoyable. And that's kind of part and parcel of, of, of the nature of the work. But um, I think now going forward, I've started saying no to more things that I'm not too keen on. So event filming is something that i've done for a long time things like the racing at le mans and things like that i try not to do too much of that because i'm getting old and it's really hard work um that's the main reason also it gets it gets very very repetitive if you go to le mans every single year you start to get fatigue for like what's going to be different because it is the same every year the grid is the same every year what the drivers talk about is the same so it gets very tiresome very quickly um, so I'm trying to not do too much event stuff and trying to wait, you know, and say no to the event stuff and hope that other stuff comes in. That's generally how I operate because I don't, um, it's quite hard to go and find new people. We just put a lot of effort into contacting new people and working on LinkedIn and, and anything like that. Um, but I think for me now going forward, it's all about saying yes to the right projects and saying no to the projects that, I, that aren't going to benefit me and further my career and, and give me opportunities to make really cool stuff. Um, and yeah, try and try and work with more brands, bigger brands, and uh, get yeah, try and try and do a lot more directing. I'd say I've, I've always always done a mix of both, where I'll either either be just shooting and someone else is directing, or I'll be directing and also probably shooting at the same time. There are a few projects I do where I am only directing, and I do enjoy that a lot, and it's quite nice, especially when you've got actors to just focus on that and not focus on the camera stuff. And that works really well if you're working with people that you trust. And I've got a good, I've got an amazing network of people that I trust really well with behind the camera, work with a lot. And so I have that, I kind of have that confidence to step back and just direct and let them kind of make sure they're getting good shots. So that's the sort of thing I think I'll keep trying to push towards is more director roles um, and and bringing in crews that I work with and, and, and like working with. I think that's sort of, yeah, there's no real like, I want to work in this space. It's just I want to work with people I like and in places that are cool and with stuff that's cool. Is there any kind of advice that you could give to other filmmakers that are kind of looking into getting into filming like car related content, whether it be for commercials or like for YouTube or whatever it is? Like, is there anything that you could kind of give them as like a takeaway, like a final thought? I think <clears throat> from my experience, uh, whenever you're starting out in a thing, you have to understand you don't know everything you don't know a lot you need to be a sponge um, you need to take in as much information from people who have been doing it before and try and find ways um, to get that information and, and not ever really think oh I, I know what I'm doing I'd say 
for me that ended up being going and working for a company that had automotive clients and I could get in with people who knew what they were doing and I could learn from them and, and that was very much the case if I was always trying to learn more I was always researching stuff I was always asking questions um, and the internet is a fantastic place to get to get information from be wary of content creators on YouTube giving you advice on like how to use cameras find people who actually know what they're talking about because most of them seem to just say like how to do selfies which we don't do um and i think really get to like understand and be confident with how the tech works and how the science of it works because i work with a lot of people who have come up the same way that i've come up and we all started out kind of just picking up cameras and figuring it out ourselves but a lot of people never really got to understand what's going on there and as we now move into more comp like you know bigger codecs and and higher resolution things and it's really helpful to understand what that all means so I'd say be really interested in what the tech means and how it's progressing. Keep your finger on the pulse of all that. And uh, yeah, never assume that you know everything. You can always learn something, be a sponge, and just get out there and, and find people who are doing the same thing and try and ride their coattails for a bit until you uh, start to make your own career a bit.